Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual summit with Availity Connects. Um, I'd like to welcome you all in and uh, definitely uh, get into our discussion today. Uh, this is our final session. My name is Chrissy Hudson, and I'm a product line director here with Availity. And today I'm also joined by Eric Zimmerman and Kristen O'Brien from McDermott Plus Consulting. And we're going to dig into a discussion about payers and providers and what they should know about the No Surprises Act. Before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience that you can definitely submit your questions um, or any commentary to us through the Q&A function in um, the application today, and we'll be able to direct those to the panel and make sure we get you back some information. Um, now I'm going to turn it over. Eric and Kristen, would you like to tell me a little bit about yourself and your firm before we dig in? Sure, and I'll kick that off. Chrissy, thank you, and it's really nice to be with everybody today. I'm Eric Zimmerman, as Chrissy said, with McDermott Plus Consulting. Uh, McDermott Plus is a subsidiary of McDermott Will and Emery, the law firm, and we are a health industry specific lobbying policy and data analytics shop. And we've been working on behalf of quite a number of clients following the No Surprises Act and uh, involved in advocacy around the No Surprises Act. And we are delighted to be talking with you all about it today. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen O'Brien. I'm a vice president with McDermott Plus Consulting. Great to be here. Awesome. Thank you guys both for joining us. So I think a great place to start as this is a very complex topic is really with the big picture, right? So before we get into exactly what the No Surprises Act is, I'd like to talk a little bit about the environment that made this legislation possible and what it brought it to the forefront um, for attention today. Uh, those of us who've been in healthcare for a long time, you know, we've been hearing about transparency. We've been hearing about um, surprise billing and estimates for years, but now this seems to be getting a little more mind share and something has changed. So Eric, maybe kick us off and let me know why, why is this different? What feels different? Yeah, Chrissy, I think you, you hit it on the head. I think we have the confluence of a couple of dynamics that uh, have been going on for a while, maybe one longer than the other. Um, and that is the push toward consumer empowerment as fed through transparency. And that's really a, a, a story arc that's been going on for, I would say um, at least 15 years, you can date it back. Um, to when Congress and policymakers uh, in Medicare started to really make a push toward um, value-based purchasing and sharing outcomes information with Medicare beneficiaries in order to theoretically empower beneficiaries to make more educated choices about their health care. More recently, we've had a push into um, price or charge disclosure, and there's been some rulemakings that have required hospitals and other healthcare providers to be more transparent with their charges. And now you see the next step in that uh, story arc. And so that's a dynamic that's been going on for some time. I think um, very related, but maybe a little bit more recent is a very rapid uh, recognition of the problems that patients were facing with out of network bills, known as surprise bills that started to become increasingly common and increasingly challenging for patients as uh, payer provider dynamics around contracting changed. More providers were out of network for a variety of reasons, whether that was business strategy or um, the result of difficulties uh, negotiating contracts with payers. You know, we could certainly debate that, but either way, patients were kind of caught in the middle of that. And there started to be a lot of news stories that really highlighted the impact on patients and that spurred Congress into action. So what you see here in the No Surprises Act is really an amalgamation of those two stories. So really it's more about um, adding some transparency really when we're talking about this transparency and pulling the curtain back and putting those patients, members, depending on what your, um, what your role is in the healthcare industry in the driver's seat and allowing them um, or encouraging them to be able to be their own advocate and take a take a bigger role as, as a summary feels like what I'm, what I'm hearing there. Yeah. And I, I just real quick, I will add that this is not really a partisan issue, both the law um, as well as most of the um, legislative and, and uh, administrative mandates around transparency have been shared by Republicans and Democrats. And, and we, while we might see different um, elements emphasized in one administration versus another, it's something that, um, most presidents in the last few administrations have really prioritized that consumer empowerment objective. 
No, that's a great, great point, Eric. And it kind of leads me to a next question. I'll, I'll kind of throw over to Kristen a little bit is when we think of you're saying it's a bipartisan effort. Well, when you look at healthcare, sometimes it can feel partisan between providers and payers, right? And there's very much a, um, there is uh, overhead and there is the administrative um, changes that'll be needed in both of those parties based on how this, this act is put together, right? So could you give us a little bit de um, deeper discussion on what the No Surprises Act is and how that's applying to, to sort of both sides of the coin, um, our provider and our payer audience? Yeah, sure, happy to do it. So exactly that, the, the law itself really touches on all major healthcare stakeholders from payers, patients, to providers. And there's really sort of three main components to the law that's helpful to remember. So from the patient aspect, there is basically a series of consumer financial protections. And those answer questions basically around how to protect the patients from surprise bills. What's the scope of services that are covered? And then this law, it's very broad. It's not just emergency sort of services. It's not just air ambulance. It, it lends itself to other specialty situations, situations where the patient believes it's in a network facility, but may also see an out-of-network provider. It was, that provisions also answer questions about what the patient cost-sharing amount will be in those situations. Then, as you mentioned before, there's this process for resolving the payer and provider payment disputes. So if we are protecting the patient, putting them aside and putting their cost sharing sort of capped at a limit, what, how is reimbursement work from a provider and payment um, perspective? And there the law really sets out a process. It's not um, intended to sort of always go to arbitration. The goal is to have the provider and payer sort of work it out first through a negotiation period. And if that ultimately fails, then they would move on to what is known as an independent dispute resolution process. And that's really the provision you probably are hearing most about in the news and the press, as again, that's really the focus of these two entities with very different views, the provider versus the payer, how they're going to reconcile that. And does the dispute resolution process sort of favor one versus the other? And we can get into more detail about that. And lastly is the transparency aspects. And I know that's that's an issue that a lot of us are really focused on. And that includes what's known as the good faith estimates given to patients. So how are patients informed about the law? What are sort of price estimates that need to be given to patients in advance of scheduled services? and other efforts to improve transparency, um, including when patients can consent to out-of-network providers and rates. So it's a lot to cover, but but that's sort of the overview of the whole act. Well, yeah, we've got some, some great time to dig into that. And um, I'll share, I was just at a sort of an industry conference and was speaking with some folks. And I think you make a, a great point, Kristen, in that this is intended to um, impact and empower sort of the entire industry to start to get on the same page for all this and not just those large air ambulance bills or not just um, sort of those very mammoth um, stories that we were hearing in the news that may have been what sort of pushed some of this, this legislation forward. And I think that that's where we can really come together and help, help our audience to understand that while um, yes, some of those very outliers are what, what first got attention, this has much broader impacts and, and definitely will be something that we need to, to operationalize and get into the, the daily life of the healthcare system. So with respect um, to this particular law, right, um, it's October of 21. The law went into place. Um, it's uh, going into effect in January. It was passed, you know, in December of, of uh, the previous year. What does all that mean, right? Because we know there's been multiple rulings. There's summer and final rules, summer and comment. Um, for those of us that know enough about healthcare regulation to, to be dangerous or, or uh, just, just kind of are paying attention, what does that really mean of where we are with the law? Yeah, let me, let me take that one, Chrissy, because I think it's important for the audience to understand uh, why it is they're hearing about this in sort of an episodic fashion. This law and the ensuing rulemaking process is a little unusual. And I think for that reason, um, some people who have been trying to stay on top of this may be a little bit confused as to what's going on. So let's see if we can parse through that and clear it up. For sure. um, so most laws, when they are enacted by Congress, they require some degree of agency action to develop implementing regulations to flesh out the details of the law. 
And I would say 99% of the time, there's a singular rulemaking that comes out from the responsible agency um, on that. And it's usually a proposed rule followed by a comment period, followed by a final rule, and then it's effective and implemented. This one's a little bit different in part because it um, delegated responsibilities to three different departments. Um, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Health and Human Services because it was um, addressing elements of the Public Health Service Act, elements of ERISA and the tax code, um, uh, elements of um, labor uh, rules. And so there was, it it's, um, requires collaboration from three different departments. And it also specified in the legislation four discrete rulemakings with four different dates. Now, I will um, I try to summarize that by saying that there was a fairly clear roadmap articulated in the legislation as to which aspects of the law would be described in rulemaking at what point in time. And the department seemed to have kind of deviated from that and thrown it all up in the air. So what I will say instead is where we are at this moment um, and what to still expect. So um, we got the first rulemaking, July 1st, and that rulemaking dealt with what's called um, the Qualified Payment Amount or QPA methodology, which is a very central piece of this legislation. It speaks to um, the patient's um, overall financial liability. It plays an outsized role in the dispute resolution process, which we'll talk about. So that was the first rulemaking, and there was a comment period on that that has um, since closed. Now, um, on September 30th, you've got a second rulemaking, which has generated quite a lot of um, noise, and that one uh, treats several aspects of this rule of this law. Um, most notably, the dispute resolution process between patients and providers, and providers and payers. Um, but it also um, starts to articulate expectations around the good faith estimate and some transparency requirements insofar as they deal with patients and providers directly. Now, what we don't have at this point is um, some auditing requirements that are gonna be very relevant for payers. Um, those are still yet to come. And we don't have um, the transparency requirements that require communications between providers and payers and then on to patients. And that's a really fundamental piece of, the, uh, of operationalizing all of this. And in August, the departments came out with what's called a free, an FAQ, a frequently asked questions document, which more or less said, this is very hard and confusing and we need more time to implement this. And so we are going to, um, even though this still technically is effective January 1, we are gonna exercise what's called enforcement discretion, which more or less means um, we won't penalize you if you're not in compliance with the law until we come out with regulations. But I think it's really important to take away from all of this, that all aspects of this law, unless something changes, we can, we'll talk about that more a little later, I think, um, unless something changes, all aspects of this law become effective January 1st, and even though the department has said in a couple of instances that um, they're gonna give uh, providers and payers time to figure it out before subjecting them to penalties, um, you still have a compliance obligation and, and understanding those compliance obligations is really what's key here. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point, Eric. And that's, that's really something that we've been talking with our customers, both providers and payers about is that um, pushback or lack of enforcement definition on one one certainly doesn't mean that we all have time to kind of take our foot off the gas. If anything, it, it means that we need to double down it and go um, probably even more to work because the government is giving us some time to figure out um, a more uh, approachable way and a, a more streamlined fashion to how we can put these in place. So definitely lots of good work to do to, to figure out how to meet these regs. Um, and if we get, let's go even further, right? Let's keep drilling down into uh, transparency and specifically the good faith estimate. And I think there's a lot of confusion around that, especially when I'm talking to the provider community in terms of 
what is a good faith estimate? What um, is good faith seems very a very legal-esque term, right? What does that mean to those providers? Um, and how is the good faith estimate really maybe broader than other parts of this legislation? I mean, it's it's addressing quite a bit of um, quite a bit of uh, operation activities within practices, and and that will ultimately have uh, impact on the payer processes as well with the advanced DOB. So, can we talk a little bit about that, maybe, Kristen? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to take that one. So exactly that. Um, the good faith estimate is basically an expected amount for charges for scheduled services that has to be given to patients prior to the care. So exactly if you were planning to have a hip surgery and you wanted to understand sort of the full cost around that, not just the surgeon's price, not just the anesthesiologist's price, not even the post-acute sort of care for it, but how much all of that together sort of would cost you, um, they need to provide you sort of with a basic estimate for the entire cost of the services together combined. And again, I think that's really challenging because right now that's that's not typically how healthcare works. You have you know specific services or specific treatments segregated out at different rates and it's very difficult and you have to understand you know the individual's sort of plan and, and where they are in terms of, of their insurance in order to give that good faith estimate. So this is a significant change from, I think, what most healthcare providers are doing right now at the point of care. And as so mentioned me, before- Let me jump in there just real quick, Kristen, because yeah. I want to make sure our audience is, is understanding that and um, hearing that. Uh, from a, let's choose your hip hip um, surgery example, right? So if I'm a I'm an orthopedic surgeon that owns my own ambulatory surgery center, but maybe I employ an anesthesiology group to come in. Should that good faith estimate represent charges that are both um, part of my ownership structure as well as those that I contract with that may not be part of my ownership structure but are part of that patient's, patient's care? Yeah, exactly that. So it's broader than just your sort of bucket. They call it a convening entity under the regulation. And what that means is basically the individual that is scheduling the service has to provide and look at it, sort of all the different components and costs of that surgery or whatever it may be to provide an estimate. And it's supposed to include things, you know, really discounts that might be applied, um, sort of the full gamut of what that actual service will cost the patient. So exactly that, you can't just look at your specific portion of the cost, you really need to co communicate and sort of work with other providers to provide the good faith estimate. So it's, it's really complex. And as we mentioned right now, there's no sure. really operational way to do that. There is no standard in place. There's no sort of easy way that providers communicate to date um, to be able to, to create this estimate and then also give it to the patient. And for that reason, I think as Eric was mentioning before, they're trying to sort of figure this out as they actually create the regulations. So it's <laughs> a little bit of both of them scrambling to to put the infrastructure in place as well as create their requirements at the same time. And the other important thing to note is that it's not just insured patients. So this is where the scope of the law is, is actually broader from when most people think about surprise medical billing. It also applies for uninsured patients. So even though you, know, you might know sort of the contracted rate, you also have to be able to provide these good faith estimates um, for individuals who are self-pay or uninsured. And that portion of the law, they are very much moving forward. They are not having any enforcement delay around that portion of it. So again, when we, when we say, you know, there's, there's some wiggle room here, there, there certainly isn't across the board. That given the different scopes of the requirements, some of these are moving forward and will be expected to comply with them as, as mentioned on January 1st. No, that's a, that's a great point. And I think something else that I, um, I've been reading a lot about and talking to some providers and uh, payer organizations on is the definition of uninsured is a little bit broader than just those who have no coverage, right? Because as we're entering the the era of more and more high deductible health plans and um, there, there are opportunities or there are areas where patients are choosing not to take advantage of their insurance and um, exercising some some self-pay discount. So I think that, that that's definitely something that'll need to be taken into consideration as, as practices, health systems really operationalize this, this methodology, for sure. Um, so that 
that leads us into, um, I would say a thought that I've been having you, you say, you know, we don't, we don't know exactly how to operationalize this, right? So uh, providers and health and payers and health systems, we've been coordinating care for quite a while across multiple entities on the clinical side. So you share information through various, um, you know, interoperability and EMRs, and you, you know, we're sharing orders and, and um, checking on our patient's health, but we haven't ever really shared financial transactions across any, any sort of standard. So does it feel, um, let's talk a little bit about, is it unusual for legislation like this to be passed without a technical mandate, right? So for example, you know, HIPAA and ANSI 12 um, came sort of hand in hand and they, they gave us a guide, a guideline. They didn't just give us a destination, they gave us a map with a GPS. Um, now I think we have a, we have a destination, um, we might have a compass, uh, I've, I've yet to find a map and definitely not a, G, a GPS. So could you talk a little bit about why you think we're, we're in this place? Yeah, definitely. Um, so exactly that. It's kind of a chicken or the egg scenario, which yep. one goes first. Um, and so I think what policymakers are saying, you know, should legislation lead and, and wait for standards to be available before passing the law? Or does by enacting the legal requirements sort of push the development of new standard, standards forward? And so previously, as, as you totally mentioned, with HIPAA and other requirements, they, they put those two together. They said, you know, if we're going to do changes to privacy or security requirements, we need to have the standard developed or at least mentioned and ready to go. Where in this case, I think policymakers are saying, we aren't seeing the standards move forward by themselves or through, you know, sort of their own process. So we're just going to push on it, even if it's not maybe ready for prime time. And as you mentioned, there is no standard to date, no standard transaction that would allow providers to convey charge information to each other. That is not developed and a real critical component to this that is missing. Now, I think that what the stakeholders are saying is by putting this legal requirement down, it sort of puts the marker down and requires entities that like EHRs and other sort of vendors to really put their focus and effort on developing either improving current sort of transaction standards or, you know, developing new ones. Um, there's always been this talk about sort of the interoperability space that standards can be developed quicker and faster. Mm -hmm. But the question then is, are you really creating an optimal, optimal sort of way of doing things or is it rushed? Are you getting a standard that's not mature, a standard that, you know, has a lot of variation and is one that could add complexity and administrative burden. And I think that's the real worry right now from sort of a, technical aspect, I think they can push hard for these standards, but as a result of that, you may get a standard or, or dealing with sort of the infrastructure that's not really there. No, that's a, that's a great point. And um, just to note out to our audience, I'm starting to see some questions come in and we're definitely going to do some, some Q&A as we, we continue here. So definitely get those questions in the chat. Um, I know this is a very complex um, complex uh, legislation, so we'll, we'll go through those as we, we keep going. Uh, and I, I think what what we'll transition to a little bit is is digging in uh, a little bit deeper from an operational standpoint of putting processes in place to meet this legislation uh, without the the standardization there. So really, when you're operationalizing, um, it requires a lot of new administrative processes and communication from providers and payers. And uh, like I said, we've been doing that on the clinical side for a while, but without those guide rails that, um, Kristen, you were alluding to being clearly defined up front. So without that how, um, Eric, how much, you know, how much ambiguity do you counsel your clients to have as they move forward with this implementation on, on January 1? Like how buttoned up do we need to be uh, what are the questions they should be asking their own counsel and, and really um, sort of digging into how uh, how aggressive should we be towards good faith? How how right do we need to be and how tight do we need to be on one one? Yeah, it's a good question, Chrissy. And I think that we uh, my advice to clients when we're talking about this is get started now. You got to at, at the very least start to really understand as we are talking about today. Um, what's envisioned by this law? What's the overall objective? What are some of the parameters that we can glean uh, from the statute? And, and what can we start to build so that we can pivot more quickly when we do have a little more clarity as you're talking about? 
And I think there's a long way that stakeholders can go presently to be in a good position. So for example, I'll point out two things. One is uh, the statute is is hard to read. It's impenetrable. I, I, I am not necessarily suggesting that people go read the statute, but um, if you're inclined or if you have a good summary of the statute, um, there's a lot that you can understand about what the overall expectation is going to be of providers and payers and what some of the parameters are around that, including some of the timeframes that stakeholders will have to make these communications. And I think you can start to think about where you have internal resources now that you're gonna to have to start building into teams to be able to operationalize this when you do have more clarity. But the second thing is um, we do have the uh, interim final rule that came out on September 30th that does provide clarity, at least at this moment, on um, how patient provider communications are supposed to go. And there's a lot of parallels that uh, can be drawn or I think can be expected between that patient provider communication and what ultimately will be provider payer patient communication. And so while it's not perfect, and there's a lot of missing parts, um, kind of like building a puzzle with uh, a quarter of the pieces missing, you can still uh, build part of the puzzle and get a head start. And so that you're not um, as frantic when we do have that, uh, when we do have that clarity. Um, I think, one other thing to take note of, and this is kind of coming back to the standards piece that you and Kristen were talking about, there's a lot of um, large stakeholder engagement on these issues right now. So like the AMA, for example, um, is an AHA and the, pay, the payer uh, associations too are very um, aware of what these challenges are, what the gaps are, what kind of structures are gonna to need to be put in place. And they are highlighting the challenges to uh, the departments um, and making recommendations as to what kind of additional um, clarity needs to be provided as well as what kind of um, latitude or flexibility the departments should be giving. So um, there are ways to um, communicate some of those concerns into the departments. Right now would be a good time. We are in rulemaking. If you're already like down the road and you're seeing some of the challenges with some of the stuff and you wanna point out some of the difficulties, um, there, there are ways to do that. Um, but I think, um, you know, overall there are steps that uh, stakeholders can be taking and should be taking so that it's not um, as much of a mad dash when we do ultimately have the, uh, the roadmap in place. No, that's that's a that's a great um, place to start, and I think the the key there is start somewhere, right? Like we need to we need to um, start the conversations. We need to to work on on the plan, and it's going to take iteration. And being okay, knowing that the the iteration is going to happen. Uh, one of the yeah, sure, go ahead. I was let me let me just add, and I think um, you know working with um, I'll put this in the shameless plug uh, category. Working with a convening organization that is you know enabling um, trying to facilitate some kind of standardization of communications and, and creates pathways for those communications that ultimately are gonna hap have to happen between providers and payers is you know, one way to get a good head start on all of this. Yeah, definitely for sure. And I mean, with that, you know, HHS, as you said a little bit earlier, the regulation they said would go into effect, effect 1-1 for insured patients with delayed enforcement but we're gonna have enforcement on uninsured. And we agree at Availity that the um, deadline is aggressive, but I, I must say in my, I'm considered sometimes a worry wart, right? Like I, I'm looking, not always a glass half full person, but we are deeply concerned that delaying enforcement will give folks um, a, a, a sense of uh, a pause, right? And, and move back some of the urgency that's needed. The reason we have the pause in, in our humble opinion, um, as an organization is that because the um, operationalizing this is going to be difficult. There, there is a lot of work to do and it, it is time for us to, to roll our sleeves up with everything from the payers 
to um, vendors, to providers, EMRs, EHRs, PM systems, and, and work together. Um, so what is your opinion on really delaying that enforcement? And do you anticipate it being reinstated in 2022, given um, some of the some of the relaxation we have seen on a couple of the work groups, right? We've seen a couple step back and say, let's let's take a breath and see what else is coming. Um, and I'm not sure that was the the intent of the delay. What what's your guys' take on that? Sure, I'm happy to, to chime in there. Um, so exactly that. I don't think this is is going away. This is so important for from a patient perspective and a policy perspective that even though I think they're delaying some aspects of it, there is no way that they're gonna take their foot off the gas. It, it, this was a priority for Congress. This was a priority to seen for reducing costs. And as a result of that, I think the delays are sort of to get folks up and running, but they're not gonna give you this huge runway and leeway forever. I, I think it's, it's, it's the delay to sort of recognize that some of the infrastructure is, is actually just simply not there but they're gonna push that timeline as, as hard as they can to get it there. So exactly what you're saying, the, even though the standards and the technical requirements are, are to be put in place, um, it's not a pass. These, they are gonna move forward and we need to be sort of gearing up and getting ready for them to have enforcement very shortly. Um, I think especially um, aspects of the law, they're sort of piecemealing it right now, but. That means they are going to push through the, the portions of the law that they feel are ready for January 1. I think come January 1, certain provisions like the uninsured portions, the protection for patients are likely to be in place, you know, barring other outside, you know, litigation or other aspects that we can talk about in more detail. But I really just think exactly as you mentioned, that, that this is something that everyone needs to be very much focused on um, for the near future. Yeah, no, that's that's um, exactly where we're at, and and definitely encourage the audience to to kind of continue having those conversations. You know, I was going to move into a question really about you know we've been going through a lot and and bubbling it up to what are some key takeaways, but we've had some really good questions come in. I think I'm going to throw those a couple out to you so that as we summarize, we'll we'll get, get those in there. So the first, we do have a, a variety of payer um, representation attending our our call today, and you know it's. There's been some conversation as well about notification of services and the advanced DOB and how that differs from um, the requirements under the good faith estimate and really who's re responsible for delivering what, right? Is a payer responsible for the good faith estimate? Is a provider responsible for delivering the AOB? Um, how does how do we all play together, not step on one another? And what it, what is what is it really defined as? Sure, so I can start. So for insured patients, the, the providers will be in charge of transmitting the good faith estimate to the patient's health plan. And the health plan is supposed to use that information to create an advanced explanation of benefits for the patient. Now, it works a little bit different for uninsured patients. Um, in uninsured patients, the provider has to send the estimate directly to the patient. So it really will, you'll have to sort of create two different pathways based on the patient's sort of insurance status. And that, yes, will require you to sort of operationalize different requirements depending on, on the patient. So using myself as an example, I, I work for Availity. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida as our coverage. If I go see my orthopedic group for a carpal tunnel surgery, um, as an insured patient choosing to bill that, my um, surgery group would need to notify or provide that estimate back to my payer so that they could utilize that as opposed to the, uh, um, the with your interpretation, actually handing that estimate to me. Is that a, is that a fair um, summary as a, a working example? Yeah. Right. Because the, the, the payer is, um, you might have all kinds of different cost sharing obligations and positions vis-a-vis -vis your deductibles and copays and things of that sort. Um, I, I will point out one thing that I found interesting in the rule that we just got that is related to this. Remember, the rule that we just got on September 30th dealt with uh, provider disclosures to patients who are uninsured or self-pay only. Mm -hmm. But um, notably, even though the requirements 
for the good faith estimate, again, as I said, sort of parallel in a lot of ways thematically, the advanced EOB process where we don't have clarity right now. Yeah. Um, there's this, the same obligations in the statute about making certain disclosures. What um, the departments did though that I found interesting was they um, require providers to make disclosures about the availability of good faith estimates and not necessarily to provide good faith estimates. Now, I think practically speaking, the second you tell somebody uh, who's uninsured that we could provide you with a good faith est estimate if you would like one, I think 99.9% .9 of the time they're gonna say, yeah, I'll take that. Um, but it's an important distinction and, and um, one that it will be part of your opera, opera, operationalizing. operationalizing. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> got stuck on that one. No, that's that's a great um, clarification, and I think that that's been a topic of, of discussion in a lot of the forums I've been in, is really how many deliverables are um, are going to result to the patient slash member at the end of this, right? Will they be handed something from the provider, something from the payer, pre-service, as well as um, receiving those post-adjudication uh, I know we have a lot of our provider and health systems thinking, you know, how many how many things are we going to be truing up at the end, right? When when we're when we're resolving the the services. Uh, another question I had come in is really around how how accurate, you know, how how close do we need to be on good faith? So do we need to get down to worrying about if they are going to have ten milligrams of uh, a particular injectable versus 15 milligrams, uh, or is it just that they will be having an injectable and we can do an average, right? So can we use things like average case rates that, that are around in the inpatient um, world? How, how is the industry talking about getting to that uh, good faith estimate? So as part of the regulations, they said, if your estimate is, quote, substantially in excess, uh, you know, the actual cost of the procedures are substantially in excess of the good faith estimate. And they are defining that right now is $400. So that is not a lot in healthcare world, as you know. Right. I mean, it's very easy to, you know, say your, your very expensive surgery is this amount and then be $400 off. Now they allow and, and you are able to sort of explain why your estimate maybe off? Was it, you know, the patient acuity was much more, you know, challenging than you initially expected, or there was additional interventions that were needed, and you can sort of justify this, but that $400 marker is sort of where they are putting it at, at right now at this stage. And that, that is, is, again, for this uninsured process that's, that's moving forward, but I would just caution people that it's not a percent, it's not that you have a range and you're you're in a good seat area. If you're in a range, it's really you know they they created a, a solid dollar amount. Where beyond that, they're feeling that the patient would just be out of pocket so much that that good faith estimate would be unreasonable. And is that four hundred dollars, Kristen? To uh, is that only on the underside or kind of would we have prices right rules right? Like so, if we're estimating um, higher, is that cap there as well at the four hundred dollars or are there um, so this would be prices? like a patient would probably be happy if they, they received lower prices. So, yeah. I mean, you would probably be not taken through a dispute resolution process about having a, a higher estimate and getting a, a lower result out of it. Um, because that's sort of really the trigger for the patient to take you through sort of a, a more like process of like why they're paying this amount. Um, okay. so I would expect it only really to take take effect when you're on For the high cost side. But to your point, I think exactly that. Will that force some providers to say, you know, we're going to be cautious and overestimate? And then does that create a problem of deterring patients, you know, patient mm -hmm. access to care? How, how does all that play into it? Right. And, no. and, and I think practically as well, um, look, as I say, with so many of the decisions in here, they weren't accidental. Um, I think there's... Um, uh, some strategic thinking that went into a lot of the decisions here. And by giving a right line $400, as Kristen said, maybe that has the effect of um, motivating providers to say, hmm, we were actually, our, our charges are going to be $1,000 over the good faith estimate. Maybe we should cap them at 399 or 400 or whatever is, 
is the um, mm -hmm. you know is the safe zone there. Um, so it may have that effect too. No, it's a great great point, Eric. So the next question that came in, and then we'll we'll move on um, a little bit here is. I'm going to rephrase it slightly, but is do we believe there'll be a requirement or is there a requirement as to how the notification or the estimate should be sent paper versus electronic? I'm going to broaden that just a little bit to to um, the group and say, do we believe as we continue to define enforcement that a standard will be defined? So I know now we're not at a at a true standard. Do we believe that um, prior to defining an enforcement, do you believe a standard will be will be defined with your magic crystal ball. Yeah, magic crystal ball. I, I'm not sure they're gonna like HIPAA say this is the standard and say, you know, it's it's X. Um, I think they, they've been talking with vendors and health information technology experts. And some folks are saying, you know, we might take different approaches. Now that is not music to a lot of people's ears that want a standardized process and that want things to be done very consistently across the board. But I think the departments are basically at this point saying, you know, we, we don't have one specific standard to do this. We might leave it up to industry to figure out what's the best way and then might have different approaches. Um, so I wouldn't put my money on them saying, we're gonna select the standard and we're gonna double down on it. Um, also these, these departments are not sort of the experts in terms of healthcare standards. That is the folks that are involved in HIPAA and the people over at ONC. And to be honest, they have not been involved in this regulatory process. There's enough sort of departments already involved and they have not been the ones sort of leading the charge and sort of also providing their insight to, this, um, to these requirements. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, Eric, I'm going to put you back on the spot for just a minute and say, you know, hearing, you can hear the, the confusion in, in our audience's voice a little bit in some of these questions, and um, everyone wants to do the right thing and be moving in the right path. So looking at, you know, what, what most recently happened was the final rule on dispute resolution uh, came out. What, what should be the key takeaways for both our payers and our providers from that most recent final rule that was issued. So as they bubble it back up and say, I mean, I, I agree, I, I have those 502 pages, I think it is in the, in the federal register and have, have been sorting through those myself, but what, what are the keys? What should they be focusing on in the Cliff Note version? Well, I would say uh, several things, Chrissy. First of all, um, as you can hear us talking about, there's a lot that is clear but there's probably a lot more that is not yet clear that's um, to be defined. And even the elements of the regulations that they have defined, uh, you can identify a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty in that. And so operationalizing all of this is going to be difficult. Um, and I would say, if you're not already thinking about that, start thinking about it. As I said before, I, I would get started um, trying to um, put a project plan in place, build the teams, take the steps you can, get yourself positioned to take more steps when there's more clarity. Um, the second thing I would say is that it's going to be as difficult as this is going to be for providers and payers, it's going to be more difficult for providers and payers that operate across multiple states. There's a very um, um, unclear, I would say at this point, dynamic between federal and state law on all aspects of this, including dispute resolution, but also most notably uh, right now on the good faith estimates that um, uh, stakeholders are gonna have to really understand and evaluate, and it is going to vary um, almost assuredly state by state, depending on whether your state already has transparency requirements in place, for example, on the good faith estimate or dispute resolution processes, for example, on that aspect and trying to understand that dynamic um, and also plan by plan, whether you're dealing with um, uh, ERISA plans or, or insured plans, it's, it's, um, there's just a lot of like uh, different rabbit holes you can go down. So it's gonna be difficult and, um, but start to think about it now. Um, the last thing, um, or I'm sorry, the next thing I will say, and, and then maybe add one more, um, is adding to the difficulty of all this, it's fluid. 
right now. Now, I should have made this point a little more clear before when I was talking about the rulemaking process. I mentioned that typic the typical process is a proposed rule and a final rule. Here, um, for reasons that we won't get into, the department's issued what are called interim final rules. Now, that means it's pretty much final, but not completely final. But for purposes of operationalizing it, regard it as final um, and start uh, uh, operationalizing around what we see here today, because this is almost certainly what's going to be um, in, what's going to be the expectation come January first. Now, I'll caveat that with a couple of things. One is because it's interim final, it is subject to comments. More rulemaking will be coming out. More sub-regulatory guidance will be coming out. Um, hopefully, that just provides more clarity and not causing you to zig and zag in different directions. I, I don't expect too much of this to really change substantially, but it might. And so understand that it is fluid and um, meditate a lot on that and get into a peaceful, happy place. The other piece to fluidity that I think is important to just understand, but I wouldn't use this as an excuse to um, be inactive, is there's a lot of lobbying going on. We're expecting some litigation around this too. We'll maybe talk a little bit more that, about that in a bit. Um, that could halt implementation of the rules. It could lead to substantial change at some point. I think Chris and I both regard those as low likelihood, but um, uh, right in the short term, immediate future, but um, or between now and January 1, but absolutely a possibility. Um, and so that is something to um, keep in mind as well and keep a watchful eye on. But again, not a reason to wait and see what happens. Um, the, the final thing I'll say is um, beyond operationalizing all of the requirements that we're talking about here today, please also start to think about how this is going to change market dynamics. I think there are a lot of downstream consequences of this law that are going to affect payer provider contracting conversations that are yet to come. And we're starting to even see some of that um, in the marketplace right now. And so in addition to building the teams to simply be compliant with this law, mm -hmm. you also should start thinking strategically about um, what does it mean for your overall objectives and strategies? And do you have to rethink and recalibrate some of those strategies in light of this? Yeah, definitely far reaching are the, the results of this as it continues to grow and evolve. And um, I think that the, the strategic conversations uh, are just as important as some of these operational conversations, right? So we've got to figure out what we're doing in the meantime, but um, definitely for the the decision makers in in our audience and those that are planning for, you know, what does the next three to five years look like? I think we're going to see this as something that's that's influencing where the pendulum is is swinging for sure. Um, definitely a theme of some questions coming in. So there, I'd like to dig into a little bit of how is out of network coverage. Um, how does that impact the way that this this um, regulation should be interpreted? So when you're talking about uninsured. Um, or self-pay patients are out, those who are out of network, do they at all follow into that definition is the first question. And the second is a more specific question on when you have a narrow network or carved out, carve outs where certain products or providers may be excluded from, from coverage in your plan, does that then make that patient um, quote unquote self-insured for those particular services? So maybe I'll take a lots first of stuff swing, there. First swing at this. So on the first part, I think that it, um, Chrissy, if I understand the question, it's this is where it's important to kind of come back to that this rule has maybe two major thrusts. One is trying to protect um, insured patients um, from certain uh, financial liability when they're out of network, and there are um, those aspects really apply to um, uh, to insured patients and out of network services. Mm -hmm. And then there's the transparency pieces that 
are going to apply more broadly. And as we've been talking about, apply to insured as well as uninsured patients and understanding those dynamics. And on the question about um, if you have carve outs, uh, that's a good one. I've not um, thought about it before. Um, I, I could posit that the, um, uh, the provider in that instance, if the service well, there's a whole like coverage element to this too, which we could get into. But um, I think in that instance, if they're carved out for a particular service, then they're out of network for that service and um, the out of network elements apply. Yeah, that's, that's a, it is a, a little bit of one to, to step back and think about because, and this just, this just is a, demonstrates how complex the healthcare system is, right? So what can feel very straightforward on the surface as we start to unwind this, the spaghetti bowl, there, there will always be little pockets we've got to dig in and, and kind of roll our sleeves up and figure out, you know, what, what does it actually mean? Uh, so Kristen, one, another question that came in and, and I, I wish I could, I could give this individual uh, an answer I think they're hoping for, but uh, validating that this does have to apply in an ambulatory or an outpatient setting as well, and not just for um, with physician practice and not just those that are in, in a, um, an inpatient or a health system setting, correct? Yeah, it's not just inpatient. It is defined sort of facilities, but facilities include hospital outpatients um, and, and even broader, broader than that. So yeah, it's not just those that are in a, a brick and mortar hospital. Um, and, and so, yeah, you have to sort of view it from, from a much broader, broader scope. Okay. Um, no, that's great. And I, I think we've had, had some really good discussion today. And uh, I know we have the, the audience now is thinking they've, they're hearing all this, right? Um, we know we've brought some clarity, but we're hopefully also doing a little bit of a call to action um, in terms of what are the next steps? So Eric, Kristen, what would be your recommendation to those that are, are sitting in the planning seats as well as the strategic seats at our um, health systems, our provider offices, our payer organizations, you know, what, what should we be doing next? Who should we be talking to? How, how can we make a difference tomorrow by, by what are the conversations we should start? So maybe I'll, I'll start on that, Chrissy, and I'll say, um, we've alluded to this a couple of times that, um, it's a fairly controversial rule. Some of the choices made by the departments are um, perceived to be inconsistent with the statute or inconsistent with the intent of Congress. And I mentioned how this could be, um, this could alter market dynamics. And I, I think there's, um, uh, as a result, a lot of concern about what this could mean, particularly for providers going forward. And so there's a lot of talk um, or, or let me put it differently. There's a lot of lobbying activity that's going on right now. Um, stakeholders on all sides are um, addressing members of Congress, uh, either requesting changes or um, urging them to stay the course with the, the choice the departments have made. Um, so engaging with uh, those lobbying activities certainly would be one productive way if you see substantial uh, challenges with this uh, law. Um, there's also conversations around um, litigation uh, right now that are going on, and we're expecting some major uh, associations or societies to potentially um, file lawsuits ag against the department seeking to block implementation. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, and then at least this most recent rulemaking is still in a comment period, which is open until December 6th. And so again, if you uh, have concerns about certain aspects or there's a lot of instances where the departments have specifically solicited feedback because they're unclear on certain um, aspects of, of how to implement the law, they wanna hear from the uh, stakeholder community and it's a very productive way to have your voice heard. No, absolutely. I, and those are all great suggestions. Um, I would definitely also say, you know, encouraging the question, uh, the conversation with your vendor. So those of us like here, here at Availity and your, your, um, if you're in the provider seat, your practice management, your EHR systems, 
and at the payer seat, those that are actually um, handling your communication with your with your members, et cetera. Um, we're, we're eager to have those conversations because we do know we're in a little bit of this chicken and the egg, Kristen, I think you're the one who had brought that up before. And if we all just kind of keep wondering, wondering who's going to start, we know someone has to start and we don't want to, we understand that multiple um, paths forward will lead to complexity and potentially additional timelines. So um, definitely encouraging those conversations and they should be um, very collaborative conversations because we're all in this together, right? This is something that both the, the payer and the provider community are going to have to um, roll up our sleeves, go to go to work together and understand how we can um, how we can absolutely benefit the member and the patient. There's there's no doubt that this is good for um, for the patient in this um, particular uh, in this particular scenario, but it does cause some there is some administrative um, operationalizing that we need to, to get to work on. Yeah, and just on that, I think exactly that. You can't assume that everyone's on, on the vendor side is on top of this. I think from, from our perspective, we've seen some that are following it very closely and others that like the transparency requirements that came before and sort of hospitals and providers thought there would be you know, this magic workaround provided from their vendors or, or others to do it for them. I don't, you know, I honestly don't think that's gonna be a, the case across the board, so definitely important to have those conversations and also vendors and others are also dealing with gearing up or, you know, the interoperability and information blocking requirements. So they have a lot on their plate too. Um, and adding this is sort of a, a another feature for them is, is going to be complex. No, well, and sure. on that point, um, Chrissy compliments to Availity for you're obviously staying on top of this very carefully and you're um, uh, flagging it for your customers uh, early on in the process. We did just get the rulemaking as we're talking about here and it's um, great that you're bringing this education to the community. Yeah, and that's that's really where we wanna to try to, to leverage our ability to set. So we set in the middle aisle a little bit, right? Between um, providers, payers and vendors and, and uh, are, are happy to serve as a conduit whenever possible to, to really start those conversations. We have uh, members on um, WeD, on um, Cooperative Exchange, on CAQH, and we're, we're out, uh, Fire, DaVinci, we're out there having the conversations and we wanna um, move towards the, the best possible um, resolution. Couple more questions here before um, I let you guys go. If you're if you're good with that, uh, they I, a lot of reaction to your four hundred dollar comment, Kristen. I think it, people are hungry for something they can grab onto that's like real, right? So, is that um, just for uninsured patients, or is that also for insured patients? Is the question. So right now we only have the the specific requirements for uninsured patients. So that is okay. for, for that self-pay uninsured patients. Again, as, as Chrissy mentioned, that, that's not, that's broad. That, that, that applies to people with short-term duration plans, things like that, but it's, it's the uninsured side. They have not given us sort of what happens um, for the insured. Okay, perfect. And, and no um, timetable on that, by the way. We, uh, no, okay. no clue if that's coming um, next month or late next year. Okay, no, that's, um, that's great to that's great to hear. Um, and let me scan through here, make sure I grabbed everything because we've got a we've got a chatty group here. Make sure we've got everything um, taken care of. I think that's the last of my questions that came in. This has been a a great discussion. I know I leave every um, one that I've been in, and this is a a fairly decent sized part of my life here at Availity lately as we're we're doing this with, with more information and, and I know there's always more to, to have. So appreciate you guys joining us today. Um, sort of some closing thoughts from either of you that you would like to, to add anything you think we haven't covered um, in our time? Just as Eric's mentioned, I mean, I think we're waiting for more pieces of all of these requirements to come together. So, you know, this is sort of a, a wait and see, but we, we expect that there be additional guidance, hopefully some more clarification, but something to pay attention to because we are waiting for that information. Awesome. Eric, anything, anything from your side? Uh, nope. I would say, uh, I think we've said it all. Start thinking about it, start paying attention, start trying to figure out how to implement it. And if we can help with uh, any questions, we're delighted to do that. Absolutely. So it's been a pleasure having you guys with us today. I, I really have appreciated you joining us for this great conversation with our 
um, with our audience. And I want to thank them all for attending today's session. 